morning. Welcome to the Village Talks. Um, I'm speaking about vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle and vehicle-to-infrastructure communications and security. Um, if that's the track that you want to go to, you're right here, not over there. I was there in the beginning. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a projector, so I can't show you my nice slides that I made for you. Um, I tried to publish them afterwards somewhere uh, so they can get them. Um, so we tried to give you the idea of um, what we're doing, what it's all about. Um, I have to make a small disclaimer at the beginning. I work for an OEM. Uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of them today. Um, I have a couple of slides that you don't see today uh, from the USDOT. I am not speaking on behalf of them over here. Uh, I got the permission to show them. Um, you won't see them, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm the, uh, one of the principal investigators for CAMP, which is the Crash Avoidance Metrics Partners. Um, and I'm working on the topic of um, the V2X security credential management system. And um, maybe a question up front, who is familiar with the term V2X? Okay. Who knows how it works? <laughs> okay. Um, so V2X is the acronym for vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure communications. And actually it's it's um, a messaging, unmanaged messaging, broadcasting messaging uh, from vehicles to other vehicles or from infrastructure to vehicles or the other way around. Um, that's literally basic, the basic technology um, that's behind it. And on top of that, it's the applications, I guess, what everybody would think about when we speak about V2X. Um, it's applications like, for example, do not pass warning, so you're behind a car. Um, you want to pass this car, but there's an upcoming car. You can't see the car yet because it's a curve or whatever. Um, and as soon as you hit the indicator, um, it should show you a warning, hey, there's an oncoming car you shouldn't pass right now. Um, that's something that you can't do with um, sensors nowadays because sensors always um, require a direct line of sight. Um, so there are a couple of use cases that you can think of um, that you can't do with um, sensors um, that you can do with V2X. Left turn assist is another one. So if you do a left turn and there's an approaching car from the left side, it's a um, uh, situation where you can't look around the corner so you don't know if there's actually somebody. And if you drive too fast, uh, towards the intersection and there's actually a car coming on, it will show you again a warning saying, hey, you better brake. Um, it's all about warnings right now and for the foreseeable future, it will not be anything else. Um, we might, or OEM start thinking about a uh, sense of fusion, but what will never happen is I think that any OEM will purely rely on V2X messages to engage brakes or something like that. This is not gonna happen. What might be happen is that you use it for existing um, assistant functions like um, automatic braking and you use it as an um, additional input to slow down the car, for example, to deaccelerate but not to engage brakes. Uh, you will engage brakes as soon as a sensor can verify this information that you got up front. Um, just to set, make the setting uh, clear, that we're talking about. Another one, when you speak about um, infrastructure to vehicle, um, you can think about a traffic light that sends the information, uh, I'm red right now, um, and if you approach too fast, it will show you again a warning that you should break. Or it could uh, send you the information, um, next green phase is coming in 20 seconds, and you could try to um, sail towards the traffic light so you don't speed up, you don't brake, because you know the um, green face will coming. Um, so there are a couple of use cases that you can think of that you can do with this technology. There are also a couple of use cases around that are trying to mimic existing um, features like there's a car braking right in front of you. Um, doesn't make much sense because you already have sensors. I think in most of the cars nowadays, um, even uh, on the lower end, you already have those kind of sensors that you can use for that. Um, how will the lo uh, devices look like? Um, you will have integrated devices into cars for sure. Um, you will have aftermarket devices that you can put up on your dashboard. Um, and you will have roadside equipment, um, stuff that you see on traffic lights or somewhere on the side of the road. Um, 
I brought you a couple of pictures. Unfortunately, I can show you them uh, right now um, so that you have an idea how this looks like. Um, there's a fourth class of devices that I didn't show uh, today or didn't put in the uh, list. And this might be actually laptops, like your guys' laptops, I don't know, any car hackers here. Um, they try to mess around with the system, so we need to prepare, be prepared for this. Um, why is this relevant? So, I think by now it's like 15 years of research in this area. So, why it is suddenly so urgent, or how is everybody picking up this uh, right now? This is because we start deploying this technology. So, um, in 2014, there were the so called connected vehicle pilots that got awarded. A couple of cities got uh, money for deploying um, Media X technology from the uh, DOT. And they will actually start putting devices in cars and putting devices on the roadside next year. So this will be out there. Be prepared. Get your laptops ready. Um, they are in Wyoming. In Wyoming, they, we have a big corridor um, on a highway. It will be mostly V2I applications for trucks, truck management. I think the most interesting one uh, is, will be in New York City, uh, where, we, uh, where we have 10,000 cabs equipped with V2V equipment. There are a couple of V2I use cases as well, but I think that will be one of the biggest V2V deployments that we see in the near term future. And then there is in uh, Tampa, Florida, another uh, one which is um, a little bit of both worlds, V2V and V2X. Um, I got you a list of all the applications that um, they proposed to implement. It's quite a huge list, like 25 applications maybe. So go check out the slides or ask me afterwards if you want to get them directly. Um, then you can see this list. Um, there's public information how those applications work. So if you want to look into um, data formats um, that are used to send over the air, um, how the receiving end is supposed to react to this. That's all out there. And then there's another project, Smart Cities. Um, it's a quite large project. I think it's $50 million. Uh, um, and it will happen, I think, in um, Columbus, if I'm right. Um, and this is a lot a larger approach towards smart cities. So you only, not only see V2X connected vehicles, but you will also see smart homes, all kinds of use cases that are smart connected. Um, but V2X will be one of them as well. So if we speak about V2X and technology, um, I brought you a couple of information about how this actually works. So that it's, um, this, uh, it's using the so-called dedicated short range communications. It's a low latency Wi-Fi like medium. Uh, it's sending on 5.9 gigahertz, um, which is quite a nice. It's an IEEE 802.11p um, standard. Um, so um, it should be quite easy to get on this channel with your laptop. You don't need any, have any special hardware for this. Any Wi-Fi chip should be able uh, to be on this band. Um, it broadcasts messages. So you can receive them in an area of up to 300 um, meters, in a range of up to 300 meters. If you have like nothing out there, you're in a plain field, it might go up to 800 meters, um, but it's really, really the best case environment it could even be. And if you go to cities like New York, downtown Manhattan, um, I think it will be even less than 300 um, because of the um, buildings that you have in there. Um, there are P2P functions as well, so you um, not only send broadcast those messages, but there are some applications that forward those messages as well. For example, um, a better version of ACC, or the Adaptive Cruise Control, where you can already look ahead a couple of cars, and they will forward the messages and verify with their sensors if this car is actually in your lane. So you actually know, okay, if this car is braking, I can already deaccelerate uh, the car until I verify with my sensors that the car in front of me is actually braking and then I brake as well. It makes the whole area of CACC much smoother 
um, because it also can use the indicator. So the indicator gets sent over the uh, air as well. So as soon as you see somebody hit in the indicator, the sensors will take some time until they recognize that the car is actually moving in your lane. But with this, you can already prepare the car and slow down. Or if it's leaving, so if you, if you drive with ACC right now, that's, I think, the feature that, that bugs me most. If it's leaving your lane and you can actually speed up, it waits and waits and waits and waits and waits right now, and then it speeds up. With V2X, we would be able to say, okay, this is already indicating, so I can prepare the car to ac accelerate, and as soon as I see a little bit of movement uh, with my sensors, I can go ahead and start. Um, A um, little bit more about technology, so what we are uh, doing over here. Um, as I said, it's an IEEE A802 family. Um, for lower level def definition, we have a 10 megahertz um, channel, or a couple of them actually. Um, one control channel, a couple of service channels. Um, there's an additional network layer um, defined for this, and um, the payload definitions are most of them SAE standards, or the ones I think that they got deployed are SAE standards already. Um, the, um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I have a nice picture of the whole stack uh, in here so that you can see uh, which different technologies um, you need to implement in order to send those messages. So it starts with IEEE 802.11p. Then you have uh, the IEEE family of 1609. Um, it starts with 4.3.2 is security, actually. And then on, on top of that, you have um, the application layer where we use SAE standards like J2945.1, uh, for example, for the so-called basic safety messages. That's the first um, message that we will, or that will be deployed over there um, for safety features like warning about breaking events or stuff like that. Um, the University of Prague has actually already created a kernel patch to support um, IEEE um, 802.11p and the OCB mode because you don't join a network over there, you just start sending. So we need to use a, a new kernel mode um, for sending those messages. Um, you can download it, it's, it's free on, on GitHub. Um, there is a, still a small issue, I think, um, with, the, um, with the ATH 9K driver, the Wi-Fi driver that you need to have, because um, there is a database which implements the regulations that you have in the different countries, like which channels you're supposed to use uh, and stuff like this. And this, I think, um, permitted us to actually go to this um, channel that we need to use. There are some patches out there already. Um, I don't know if they work. I haven't had the time to test them out. But feel free, take this information if you want to build something like that. Um, I think they are happy to help out. Um, they are very active on, on the mailing list, so it shouldn't be an issue to uh, get in touch with them. Um, basic safety message. So what's, what's in there? What do we send over there? We send speed, we send the position, we send the heading and the acceleration. Those three data points is what we send with 10 hertz, so 10 times a second. This message gets sent out from each and every vehicle um, that is equipped with that. And the information is signed, so there's a digital signature in there. Um, and I think every, um, every fifth message we send a certificate with that as well. So you can verify if this information that you just received is stemming from a trusted source. That's the idea. Um, oh, and there's date and time in there as well. For uh, traffic light um, applications, there are a bunch of different messages defined already. Uh, one of them is the so-called SPAT message. Um, there is encoded the movement state, um, which is like the traffic light phase. It is in there right now. What's the ending time? And based on this, you can think of a couple of um, applications that you can build on top, like red light violation warning. You get the information. It's still 20 seconds red, but the car is approaching way too fast, this traffic light, to so send a message to the driver, hey, better engage your brakes. Um, all those messages, as I said, get signed. Um, we have one 
uh, type of certificates for each field. So we have one f um, for V2V messages. Um, they are called pseudonym certs, uh, pseudonym um, certificates. And we have application certs for um, the V2I area. The pseudonym certs are actually um, um, quite new concept uh, in, in this area because um, this technology is going to be mandated eventually. And that means that each and every new vehicle sold here in the US needs to be equipped with V2V and need to send those messages. And in order to avoid that somebody is sitting on the sidewalk and just sniffing messages and being able to track cars um, by just doing so, we need to avoid that there are any uh, permanent IDs in the messages and we also need to avoid that they can just use the certificate that we use to sign the messages in order to track the cars. So you have actually a whole bunch of um, so-called so pseudonym certs that you use um, and that you exchange frequently. They are good for a week, so the validity period is one week and after this week you throw them away and get a new bunch of certificates. Um, the architecture for this is quite complicated. So the architecture for the CA or the public key infrastructure that we built for this um, because we only, you don't only want to protect against outsider attacks like somebody sitting actually on the sidewalk but also against insider attacks. So somebody running a part of the PKI should also not be able to tell which pseudonym certs belong to which vehicle because otherwise he already has this information he just needs to start listening out in the field and see where cars are going. Um, this actually will be quite hard to explain if you don't see it uh, over there so I brought a picture of the architecture. <laughs> um, but I, I, I give my best. So you start with an enrollment cert. That's the very first certificate that you get. Um, this is not, uh, this is per device that is out there in the field. And this is only used for communication with the security credential management system. So you never use this certificate for anything else than just authentication against the um, STMS um, security credential management system. With this enrollment cert, you can go to the registration authority and download or request pseudonym certs or application certs based on the permissions that you have uh, within this enrollment cert. If we focus on the pseudonym certs for now, um, because they are the ones that need to have this special protection against insider attacks, um, the registration authority will um, take your request. It's a single request. Um, we use a technology called Butterfly Key Expansion um, to expand this one request to initially 3,000 um, pseudonym cert requests. And the device not only sends this request, but it also sends a response encryption key. The registration authority takes those individual requests, expands the request, and expands this response, uh, response encryption key as well, and forwards them to the pseudonym uh, CA, certification authority. This authority creates the pseudonym certs, encrypts them with the uh, response encryption key one by one. The requests are shuffled, so they are not sent batch-wise, like I get one request, send 3,000 up, get another one, next 3,000 but I shuffle them on the RA level so that the PCA is not able to tell uh, just by looking at the sequence, okay, there's a high probability that this uh, set of pseudonym certs actually belong to one device. They encrypt them, um, send them back to the RA, so the RA cannot look into um, the certificate, um, zip them, and then get them ready for download of, uh, for the devices. Um, maybe a little bit later about how we do um, revocation in this case. So why it's important that uh, when we have the system, we would still be able, if it's a single organization running the whole uh, public key infrastructure for this, this organization would still be able to tell, right? Because it just needs to look on the different components within the system, get the data from there, and then they can make pretty good guesses um, which certificates belong together. So what we need to have in this public key infrastructure is a separation of duties, a separation um, of the different components. And there are some components that shouldn't be in one single hand because if you combine those information, you again get again the information about um, 
which certificates actually belong to one uh, single car. So registration authority that I just introduced and the pseudonym cert author, uh, authority, they shouldn't be able, they shouldn't be run by one single um, organization because if you get the requests and they're, even if they're shuffled, you still can trace back um, which certs belong to one um, batch. Um, we have one um, speciality in this PKI that you don't see in any other PKIs, I guess. Um, that's the so-called linkage authority. Linkage authorities are used to generate um, linkage values and those linkage values are get, uh, put into the device and in the certificate as well so that once we start doing misbehavior investigation, which is the part that we need to do in order to identify your laptop on the sidewalk sending messages, for example, by using fake certs or actually uh, using real certs that you extracted from a device that you found somewhere. Um, we need to be able to tell again which certs belong together, right? Because if you have a whole bunch of pseudonym certs and we are speaking about 3,000 worth of three years uh, initially that you put in a uh, vehicle, uh, if one of them get get blacklisted or revoked, you just take the next one, right? So there need to be some mechanism in there that we can use in order to identify still which uh, belongs to um, together, but in a way that I don't get the actually pseudonym certs out there. So I shouldn't have any single component again in the system which knows the actually certs and which of those certs belong to a single set or a single device. So what we do here is we have um, so-called linkage seeds, um, which is a hash value. And we have two separate linkage authorities, both with those seeds. They again need to be run by different organizations and they generate so-called pre-linkage values. So they take a hash value, create another hash of it, 20 per week, um, send them back to the RA, uh, actually, or yeah, via the RA to the PCA, they're encrypted um, with, um, with a key towards the um, PCA, so the RA cannot read them, and the PCA will XOR them together to get the linkage value. It's a little bit complicated if you don't see the pictures right now, so I apologize for that. Um, if you have any questions towards this, feel free to reach out um, to me or ask them right after the talk. I give a little bit, hope I have a little bit uh, more time for this. Um, but it works in a way that you only can do, f it's, it's a forward hash, so you can only take the latest one and if you get the linkage seat again, you can put this on the CLL and everybody can do the same calculations to find out if a um, linkage value that uh, is in any pseudonym cert belong to a group of linkage uh, pseudonym certs that are revoked. That's the whole idea. So we put out the linkage seeds once we identified that there is some high kind of misbehavior out there. Um, so those linkage authorities needs to be separated in different organizations and they also be need, to, uh, need to be separate from the um, pseudonym CA because that's um, the place where they were um, XORed and if the PCA knows which initial hash values were used, they can just do the calculations and get the information um, which pseudonym certs belong together. Um, so I'm talking about misbehavior detection. I think if you um, if you have a system like this, we can almost expect that you guys will work on this and see what, what you can do. Um, we know that people are able to extract those, um, extract any private keys from devices. Um, there are very sophisticated techs out there. So we need to anticipate in the system already that eventually private keys get extracted um, certificates will be flying around and we need to have countermeasures for this. So the countermeasure for this is we do some kind of misbehavior detection. Um, that is we try to validate information already on the car, that's the local part to it, local misbehavior detection, and see if they make sense. Like for example, if you get two messages from supposedly two different cars signed by different um, pseudonym certs, and the location that is sent in there is so close to the other location that either they crashed right now in front of you or something is wrong. 
there could be tons of different reasons for this, right? There could be bad GPS re uh, reception. There could be an error in the GPS module. Um, there could be actually somebody sitting on the sidewalk and sending messages and getting in the same location as a car in the street. Um, we don't care about what the reason is because the standard says that if you know that you have bad GPS reception and most modern GPS devices are able to tell um, how good the accuracy is, uh, you stop sending. So if you implemented everything correctly on the device and on, in your car and nobody's spoofing, um, you're not supposed to send. If you still send, we can assume that there is some kind of misbehavior we don't care if it's wrong software on your car or if it's somebody sitting on the sidewalk. There's something wrong and we, shown, we shouldn't issue warnings based on your wrong locations to other cars. So if we detect this, um, the vehicle that detected this misbehavior will send up a report and the reports get um, put into this investigation where we try to um, see if they belong together. So you get like two different messages from um, signed with two different pseudonym certs, but stemming from the same device. And what we do then is we take those pseudonym certs and send them to the linkage authorities in order to get um, a trace back to, throughout the system to see if they belong to the same linkage seat in the very beginning. The answer that the misbehavior authority, which is doing this process, will get is only um, there is one um, pseudonym search in here, and I tell you which one. And there were five others in the, your request that belong to this, but I don't tell you which ones. So we again try to protect the privacy um, of the actual device, even when we do misbehavior investigation up to the highest level possible. Um, and once we identified that this is actually a misbehavior, so we got enough reports. Again, enough is a question about what the report was about. So for example, if we have this overlapping and we have two different cars reporting the same um, set of pseudonym certs doing this, we can assume that there is something going wrong. Um, we then put those information on a certificate revocation list, put them out to the system, and then they need to be distributed to the cars. And that's, that's a weak point in the system right now because we need to get them, those information as soon as possible out there. Um, one problem that we have right now is that we can't assume that all cars, uh, cars are connected every time. So we need to find a way to get those um, CRLs to them even if they are not online. And one of the projects that we're um, starting to implement is um, a P2P network between cars so that you actually can ask another car that is um, within your um, range, do you have a newer CRL? And if so, please start sending me this CRL. Um, this will go until we have a reasonable amount of numbers of cars that are out there that, that are connected. Um, and then we might start speaking about other um, technologies than CRLs in order to get those bad certificates out of the system. But up to then, um, I think that's the only solution that we have right now. Um, one problem that I wanted to talk a little bit, and I hope I have um, yeah, 10 minutes left. Um, so we have a traditional PKI. And in any traditional PKI, you have a root CA, anchor of trust. And the problem, again, is um, there's a validity period. So we don't want to have a root CA that is flying or which is valid for, I don't know, 50, 70, 80 years just to match the lifetime of a vehicle uh, of about 20 years, some say 40 years. Um, so we need to get shorter lifetimes in there. And we can only do this if we have a rollover, right? That's traditional PKI um, mechanisms. But if we roll over to a new route, how do we get this route out to the vehicles so that they can start using or start using this new route to verify incoming messages? Um, what you do traditionally is you do a software update, firmware update, browser updates. That's how it works in the internet world. Um, but there's no way of doing this if you are not online or if you are asking somebody on the street like another car, hey, I saw your message links up to a different trust chain and I don't know this route, so what do I do? Um, and the idea that we came up with is the so-called Elector concept. 
So we have some kind of superpower in there. They are not part of the PKI. There are some kind of signature C um, CAs. So all they do is they sign a message uh, which says this certificate over here is a new route and we um, we ensure that this is part of the system. Um, there's always a quorum. So we have like for example we start with three electors and as long as at least two of them sign the message that this new route is part of the system from now, uh, you can trust them. Those three electro certificates get pre-installed on all the devices. And the good thing is if it's three, we can also remove them and get new ones in there. Like the same operation like as if we add a new route, we have a message to add a route, we have a message to remove a route. If it's going bad like compromise or something like that in the worst case. And the same uh, with the electors. As long as you have three electors, you can always add a fourth elector by having at least two s signing um, the message and then remove the one that you want to exchange with the new three new ones. So with that we have some kind of democracy up there uh, where we always already can vote, always can vote new electors in there and add and remove um, root CAs from all the devices. And the nice thing about this um, is that you don't need to have an online connectivity um, in your car in order to get those messages because again you can ask just another vehicle. As long as you get the message uh, which is signed by the electors, you can always verify if this is a trusted um, route or, or, uh, or not. So you don't rely on any uh, kind of online connectivity, you only rely on other cars telling you that this is actually part of the system. And you can do this in the moment where a car under this new route is sending you a message. So you get this message, you see the chain up to a different route and you just ask, hey, give me your route certificate and this add message. And as long as it can verify, I can trust your message. Um, we published a paper about this, so uh, if anybody wants to discuss about this, I'm more than happy. Um, and we're actually implementing this, so it's not um, something that we just talk about in, in science um, or research. Um, we actually demonstrated this um, whole PKI one week ago um, where we issued certificates that are in, in, in an amount, or we issued pseudonym certs in an amount that is equivalent to a first year's production within the US, um, which is roughly 70 million cars. Uh, so we were able to show that we are capable with this system uh, to generate enough certificates to get 3,000 um, in there per device. Um, and we showed that we are capable of running these new concepts with the linkage values, with butterfly keys, and with the electors as well. And this system will be used within the upcoming connected vehicle pilots that I um, started to talk about um, to issue certificates to devices. So whenever you are sitting on the sidewalk in the future, getting video X messages and looking into them, those certificates will be coming from our system. Um, and with that, I close my talk. If there are any questions about this, I don't know how much time we still have. We started a little bit late. We can do it right now or just grab me afterwards. I will be hanging around in a car in village, I guess, most of the time. Um, so first of all, you need to have a, um, a certificate for this, um, special certificate for this, um, and just replaying the attack, um, there's always a timestamp in there. And if there's a certain threshold, um, but this threshold is, is pretty small, so um, it's either you're within the same area and replaying within microseconds the same message, but if it's a valid message, we don't care, right? If this message is turning something green, it's a real emergency car, so the replay tech would just will turn it green again, so nothing happens. If you try to take this message and send it afterwards, um, 
once the emergency car is already through, um, the timestamp will tell the um, device that um, it's a replay attack. So it, it, it's based on synchronized clocks. We need to have synchronized clocks in all devices. Which is actually an issue because we need to agree upon one time system. There are different out there and all those discussions. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. So it sounds like you have a lot of messages going back and forth. What if somebody, a threat actor, came in and did a denial of service where they just started hitting you, flooding you? What are your mitigation techniques for each car? Um, right now, there is not a really good solution to this. Um, the only solution that we have is it's contained in a certain area, right? You can sit at one intersection and flood the channel over there and it will maybe be around 300 meters uh, where nobody can talk to each other anymore. So this intersection won't work. Uh, you won't see any messages or you will only see those messages that are coming through and you could use them to issue warnings. But if you're actually able to flood the whole channel in this area, um, the only thing that will happen is, is that devices that see those messages coming in um, will report this because you're supposed to send 10 times a second if you do it uh, more often than that. That's clearly a misbehavior that, is, uh, that, should be, or that will be reported. Um, if you're capable of doing this with a whole bunch of different devices because you prepared your attack very well, um, this is something that we can't detect if you have the right certificates and stuff like this. So if, if you look like a legitimate device and your messages make sense, like they are all on the street, they are all not overlapping, all those kind of techniques that we have um, implemented for misbehavior detection already, there's not much that we can do right now. There are some works or some research on the physical level, um, physical layer, to see if there's anything that we can do there, but that's nothing that we can implement to our production system right now. Any more questions? Yep. Pardon me? Um, so in the vehicles, clocks are synchronized via GPS. Um, there is a time signal on all on, on a GPS channel. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you can use a GPS jammer or a fake GPS. Try to introduce this into the system. Yeah. Okay, then, do you know more questions? Thanks a lot.